Welcome everyone to this Friday, June the 12th edition of Frontier Opening Bell. I am Boston Amafaye. Welcome my panelists to the show. Ayode Jiebo, who is a CEO and a chartered trader at Afrinvest Securities. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming through. Ali Khan Sacho, the rich man on the East Coast, Nairobi, Kenya, the CEO and founder of a Rich Frontiers Management. Good morning. Good morning, boss. A very big day for you. You have a budget portfolio, 2.7 trillion shillings. That's a whole lot of money for you to think about and walk through for us on the show today. Thank you. And Uchena Menes, um, who is a, a FX trader and a, a managing partner at Blue FX Nigeria. Good morning. Thanks for coming to Uche. We appreciate um, uh, your time, everyone. Uh, let's you. give uh, ourselves a very quick uh, uh, a rundown of some of the major markets we cover on the African continent on a daily basis, five major markets. The Kenyan uh, market, the Nairobi Securities Exchange, yesterday, Thursday, uh, was the outlier of these five other exchanges. The Nigerian Stock Exchange was down 0.13%. You can see that on your TV screen, the Ivorian market was a deeper in the red, 1.13%, while the Egyptian market softens about 0.9%. In South Africa, the GSE uh, finished in the negative territory, 0.13%. Four seven percent a raft of uh, not so positive news in mining production and uh, manufacturing uh, in South Africa, Africa's most advanced economy. We'll talk about that later on the program. But very quickly, let's uh, I let everyone know. Of course, if you're in the market, you already knew that it was a red red bloodletting there across the global markets on Thursday. So let's uh, give uh, Uchina minutes, uh, about a one minute, to give us a wrap up, a, a, a wrap up of that for us. Uche, start the show. Right, <coughs> right. I don't, right. I don't think one minute will be enough, but I'll try my best. Anyway, um, the the sell off we saw yesterday was as a result of market participants coming to the realization that um, you cannot print away um, the issues um, in the market. Really, um, there is a a combination of supply shock and demand shock in the, con in, in the country, in the U.S. at the moment. And at that point, it's getting really, really clear that it is not just going to be the situation of you printing the money. And at the same time, it has come to the realization that um, the, the Federal Reserve is assuming that the market is ideal and ideal. Hmm? Where, where you can see that the market, what, is we, what we are really getting to see now is that as they are printing those monies, monies, people are taking those extra risks into higher yielding assets and looking to invest into the market at valuations that is even overpriced. So you're seeing price to earning multiples that is just ridiculous. And you see people going into the market and trading at that point at overvalued state. Now, if you see, if you if you consider that move, that in itself creates these unintended consequences, whereby people would create or market participants outside the U.S. would would have the facade or fall into the facade that um, the financial market in the U.S. literally depletes the healthiness of the U.S. economy, which is not true, and that is why we can see the negative feedback loop, whereby you start seeing the dollar looking to rise against other currencies. So it's, it, it, it's, it's really highlighting the fact that the Federal Reserve is looking to fix financial structural issues with printing money, which is not the right and efficient way to go. They don't want to allow, um, the, the, uh, they don't want to allow economic cycle into that bottom or trying to um, correct itself, just trying to keep um, zombie companies afloat. So when you look at all of these um, um, internals, market internals, you see that there's really a significant financial structural issues in the U.S. And that in itself, market participants are starting to reprice that. And we are, that's why we are seeing those um, downside uh, moves we saw yesterday. Thank you, Uche. And, uh, not a particularly uh, 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 a good time for oil producing countries such as Nigeria. We saw oil prices uh, also down. Yesterday, Nigeria National Assembly, the legislature, uh, finally released the final figures for the budget. Uh, we're six months into the new year, and the budget is still being talked about. For the East Coast, where Ali is, where some of the big stories were yesterday in terms of the biggest economies in that region. Take a look at the uh, uh, outlook, uh, uh, a review of yesterday. The Kenyan uh, government rolled out 2.7 trillion shillings budget 
which will 2020, 2021, that will start uh, the 1st of July. The Nairobi Stock Exchange went up 1.23%. Uh, we have no idea the linkage, if there's any correlation here between the budget and the market yesterday. Ali will speak to that. Meantime, Kenya's uh, neighbor, Uganda, presented 45.5 trillion uh, shillings of its own budget, uh, looking to 21.7 trillion uh, in internal revenue. That's one story there. So let's just throw this uh, uh, to Ali to bring us up to speed on yesterday's East African Communities Budget Day. Thank you, Bison. So obviously, pretty big day. Um, uh, just to quickly answer your question, the budgets were presented after the stock market closed, so there was no correlation. It was more of anticipation of what was going to come out. Um, here in Kenya, the, uh, the cabinet secretary presented um, a budget that's going to require approximately $8 billion of borrowing. Uh, he was forecasting revenue increase year on year, just shy of double digits. Um, and basically, uh, there's some really great Kool-Aid going around and uh, we're, we're drinking it. I expect a revenue undershoot, borrowing to hit $10 billion. And mm -hmm. my concern is that in the current environment, a $10 billion call is just uh, not going to prove feasible. But I think what we're really seeing is um, a, a situation which is, has the potential to become disorderly in the next 12 months, where um, a restructuring, a reprofiling of the debt is going to have to happen because we can't make these numbers stack up. They're predicated on a return to growth. I don't see that coming through very quickly. So I think Kenya has got this challenge where revenues are going to undershoot and where the borrowing, total borrowing amount is going to be around $10 billion at a time when international capital markets um, are going to be very, very complex and difficult. Uganda, more conservative, slightly more conservative. Um, uh, uh, they, re interestingly, reduce taxes on mobile money um, in order to stimulate the digital economy, whereas here in Kenya, we put a 1.5% tax um, on digital transactions, which a lot of people were not comfortable with. We've got a stimulus in Kenya, about uh, $500 million. Mm. Uh, uh, that's, that's also come out. And then finally, to touch on Tanzania, where interestingly, the finance minister uplifted his GDP forecast. Um, mm -hmm. The World Bank a week ago had said it was going to be 2.5%, and he's come back and said, no, no, it's going to be 5.5%. We've, we've uh, dealt with COVID and it's all systems go. So, yeah. So overall, I think, you know, I just feel that uh, these budgets weren't entirely reflecting the new reality. And uh, the question for me is, you know, this go-go, uh, very borrowing-led uh, budgetary process we've had for the last few years, I think it's going to be very difficult to execute that. There are interesting uh, news and developments uh, on budget economy and the markets uh, uh, from the East Coast. Here in West Africa, Nigeria is on um, public holiday today for Democracy Day, or well, yesterday the uh, National Assembly uh, finalized and rolled out uh, the 2020 budget, raising it by uh, uh, a few hundred uh, billions of naira. So, uh, from Afrinvest, what's your take on this uh, new budget, uh, and how do you think there's anything in it for the market straight? That's the story there. 10.8 trillion is what the Nigerian legislature uh, okayed yesterday. Uh, so let's talk about that first, um, uh, Ayo. Yeah, thank you, Boasin. Uh, the budget that was passed was um, 300 billion above the last um, budget because this is a revised budget. And what we still, what we, what the concern there is the ability for government to be able to raise the revenue. So looking at the uh, past um, actual revenue. It's averaged around four trillion, and that is a a year without um, COVID and other pressures that we're seeing. So by the time you also you look at what you should expect this year, I expect estimate is around three point two trillion. You will see the gap 
based on the budget of about 10.8 trillion, that's a deficit of about 6 trillion. So what the next question is, how will this be funded? We know the major, the focus now is on domestic borrowing. But when you also look at the analysis, you see about 26% is, is, is still going for debt servicing. You look at recurrent expenditure, that is also still very significant. So the expected or the, based on actual revenue, we won't be able to, based on actual revenue, funding recurrent expenditure is, is also a third order. It means we'll still need to borrow significantly to fund our recurrent expenditure, leaving capital expenditure um, hanging. We know the Sukuk bond, which was oversubscribed, uh, though it's not been announced, but based on the news on the street, is that it was oversubscribed about 400%. Um, compared to a 150 offer, that's about 600 billion. If government, if, and this for the interesting thing about Suku is it's um, ring fenced for capital projects. This is an opportunity for government to, if they can absorb that fund and reallocate to new projects, this will be strictly used for capital projects. I feel that would also take care a bit, uh, take care a bit uh, of uh, the a capital project, which is about 2.4 trillion, that's about 22% of the budget. So um, we expect that within the next one or two weeks, the government, the president would um, assent um, his um, signature on that and with implementation will start. But the concern um, in the minds of um, most people would be, how do you get the revenue to, to fund? Um, and that's, that's a major um, concern. I have a quick one. Give us a minute for a roundup of the, this week's markets for, the, for Nigeria. Yes, interestingly, uh, the market sustained its bullish trend, um, closed up 0.6% um, week on week. And part of uh, what we saw, we saw the banking stocks, we saw a significant interest within the banking space. That, that was sustained. Um, two days of losses, two days of gains. And um, what we... We, we, we saw some of the results that were also published. We saw um, uh, GlaxoSmith uh, Q1 uh, 2020 results. Uh, though the top line was flat, but uh, their profits uh, also increased. We believe that uh, the company is relying more on its uh, parent company, um, Winstar Pharmaceutical Company for funding. But with the uh, new uh, international fund, uh, uh, sets aside for health, uh, health and pharmaceutical companies. We believe that the company will also benefit from it. If you look at this week, uh, Nemet uh, Pharmaceutical Company was the highest gainer in the market, gained about 56%. Uh, so, so there's been a lot of focus in that sector now because of the intervention from the CBN uh, that we believe that um, most of those companies will enjoy at the 5% um, uh, interest rate. So uh, by and large, we, we, the, the, the um, market closed positive, and we'll, we expect that it would um, trade soft next week um, on the back of the decline in crude oil prices because we've seen very strong correlation between crude oil prices and uh, our Nigerian markets. Quite an interesting, Ayodeji. Thank you so much. If we look at the, uh, uh, the healthcare stories, Lanishu, I uh, just uh, put that on the screen, the BRVM. Uh, one of the companies there uh, uh, was also paying a Sukuk loan. So the Sukuk uh, 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 is, is becoming uh, a window, uh, a non-interest uh, uh, bearing uh, debt. The Kenyans are also looking in that direction. We spoke about this a few days ago with Ali. Uh, he brought us up to speed on, on what the authorities in, in Kenya are also looking at. So uh, across Africa, it looks like this non-interest bearing is coming uh, into, uh, into play. Yeah, uh, yesterday, the, uh, the Ghana Stock Exchange announced 100,000 cities uh, donation to the National uh, COVID-19 Trust Fund. So uh, the pandemic is still out there. Everyone is putting their widow's mind uh, into the box just to make sure that we all stay safe and the economy remain, uh, people remain healthy and the economy remains healthy. But let's talk about Southern Africa very quickly. Uh, and Ali is coming back in here for us. Uh, yesterday, it was, in, it was a, a, a slew of negative uh, economic numbers for Africa's most advanced economy in mining and manufacturing. So bring that up, bring us up here, here on that. Thank you so much 
the manufacturing output 5.4% down in March, mining 47.3% in April. Ali. So I think that mining number caught everybody off guard a little bit because it spoke to a very dramatic uh, uh, shuttering of the mining sector. I mean, when following the news, I don't think anyone expected such um, a sharp slide, 47.3%, because um, the president had given them a pass um, effectively. So what it tells us is, first of all, a lot of mines have turned out to be hot spots of COVID. So I think what that's reflecting is mining companies having to take uh, remedial medical action um, in some of their mines. So we need to keep an eye on that because um, gold prices have been very firm, um, uh, palladium prices, volatile, but reasonably firm. But if you get a, a much longer cutout of this type of size, you're going to have a supply side issue developing in the minerals market that we need to keep an eye on. Manufacturing, of course, was a big headline, a sticker shock type number. But, you know, they've been in lockdown. They're only now easing from level four to level three. So you would expect it to see such a sharp slowdown. That confidence number also might, you know, 45-year low. Interestingly, you, um, you were talking about the reversal of risk appetite yesterday in the Dow Jones, and that immediately got reflected in the RAND. The RAND had rebounded from levels above 19 to levels uh, with a 16 handle. We're back at a 17 handle. Just to speak about what I think is the highest correlation uh, assets uh, with Western markets, the you know, dollar rand and the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. So quick reaction already in the rand, and I expect that reverse uh, to continue a, li a little bit more for now. Mm. Well, interesting. Uchena, where is the currency play in the entire uh, commodities market uh, that we're seeing here over the last uh, 24, 48 hours that even the metals... Uh, prices were also uh, 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 impacted by the negative sentiments coming out of the Fed meeting and the second wave of the COVID-19 being reported in a few U.S. states. Yeah, so um, commodity driven currencies, um, as we can see, as we know, um, the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollars, uh, so took a hit yesterday to following the downside pressure we saw in the market sort of highlighting the possibility that if this continues to um, unravel itself, as you've mentioned, a second wave of COVID, uh, the COVID-19, or also we have uh, the possibility of people taking profit and trying to seek for safer, um, safer um, asset classes to put in their portfolio or to drive their funds into, and we'll get to see currencies based um, on, on uh, commodity-based currencies like the Australian dollar, the Canadian dollar, continue to hit the wave. It's very, 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 very important for, for market participants now to sort of um, slow their optimistic bite of some sort. The, the last two months have just been pricing the idea that there is nothing wrong happening in the market. Everything has been taken care of. We just need to go back and reopen the economy. But now it has been it's showing right now that even in Arizona, they are looking to re-implement the lockdown as they are seeing spike in COVID cases and they are already seeing the possible overwhelming of their medical facilities. So if that is the case, if that is the case, we are not just going to see just few commodities. We are going to see oil prices trade lower, even lower than the $20 that I've sort of priced them before, um, given the fact that it is going to be a demand issue whereby really there is nothing anyone can do except just wait on for a vaccine or something that can really tell people to go back on and continue their activities as it were before pre-coronavirus. An interesting scenario. Let's throw in a bit of uh, news from uh, the North African markets here. Uh, just a few uh, of, uh, of that coming uh, uh, through the Egyptian market, as you saw earlier, uh, was, was down with Nigeria and a few others. Meantime, inflation data for month of May keeps coming through uh, from a number of African countries. Tunisia reported May inflation at 6.3 percent, the highest uh, since November. In the meantime, at Jarewafra Bank in Morocco issued a subordinated bond on, on the uh, Casablanca Stock Exchange. Meantime, one big news, Ali, from your backyard, uh, up north Sudan, uh, anti-craft agency shut down five 
uh, bureau, uh, uh, FX bureaus, what you call the currency exchanges, they're going after. Uh, there's a shortage of, of, of currency there, so I'm sure the authorities there want to be sure that no one is uh, uh, misbehaving when it comes to uh, the exchange and the currency market. The Sudan is, is not as bad as Zimbabwe or Iceland, where we've had a complete crash of the currency um, and a lot of problems. I'm sorry I didn't touch on that, but just the most extreme currency problem right now is in Harare. Um, the currency has fallen very dramatically, the rumors of a coup. Sudan similarly has a very dysfunctional foreign exchange market, a massive shortage of hard currency. Um, of course, that was at an extreme last year when we had the toppling of Bashir and uh, the new government coming into power. But clearly, they're trying to keep a handle on it. I think a lot with Sudan is going to depend upon the reconciliation with the U.S., the lifting of the terror-supporting uh, uh, language that the U.S. has placed on them, which is expected. But definitely, I think, you know, given the nature of the markets at the moment, they're trying to clamp down on speculation. And uh, there's plenty of black market and official market speculation in Sudan. Mm. Interesting. So, I think, Jebro, when the market, when the Nigerian market reopens on Monday, uh, do you think the decision, the final take by the National Assembly of the legislature on the 2020 budget will be in anyone's playbook? Okay, uh, I, I feel that uh, this is being, ex uh, is being expected, so it's not a surprise, so we don't expect any major reaction based on the budget. Um, the major reaction would be, um, or what investors would be interested in, is to see, um, to be sure of, uh, uh, of the second wave, which everyone is, second wave of coronavirus pandemic, which everyone is trying to track now, because that would continue to impact on high prices and may also trigger another um, lockdown, which would impact on global um, economic activity. I think that would be the major focus on uh, what would be on the mind of um, investors. And in, uh, next week, we'll be expecting um, the, a, bo a bond auction about 250 billion um, um, on offer uh, by the it would be offered by the DMO, which is uh, about 90 billion higher than what the yeah, normal offer has been. And we we feel that uh, uh, the conclusion of the Sukuk bond because uh, investors are still waiting for to get the, set, the settlement of the Sukuk bond, which was supposed to be last week Monday. That would also have a major role to play because. Uh, a lot of funds has, have, have, been, have been tied into that. So depending on the, uh, the amounts the government is able to absorb uh, would have a, an impact how that would perform. But we feel that rates would also still remain at that current level um, for the, uh, the five-year, 15-year, and 30-year uh, bond that the government would be uh, issuing next week. Okay, interesting. So I'm just going to ask uh, Ali and Uchena one quick question. 30 seconds each. Do you think the a bit of a resurgence of, uh, or the comeback of what you call the animal spirits on, on Market Street is, uh, is taking a hit by what we saw over the last two days this week? Big time. I think the market was overpriced. I think uh, if you look at COVID-19 numbers, we're now at a daily caseload, which is a record high, just under 140,000 a day. Africa ourselves, we, we did 100,000 cases in 80 days. The next 100,000 took 19 days. So we're also seeing an accelerated trend. I think as uh, Uche was saying, it was all about printing money and you can't print yourself out of this economic crisis. And therefore it took a little while for people to realize we had some interesting developments, these Robin Hood crazy traders buying anything that looked at a cheap price, didn't even matter if it was bankrupt. We got hurt selling a billion dollars of bonds in a bankrupt uh, shares in a bankrupt company. So I think we got totally out of whack and suddenly the pennies dropped and therefore we're going to get a big reversal. And I think the reversal is just starting. I think investors and um, maybe traders are still in a panic mode globally, trying to understand how to handle this COVID-19 
and the impact on economies and markets. Uchena, your final word, please. Where is the animal spirit at the FX market? I uh, sort of um, I agree with uh, Ali. Um, I think what, what we might be getting now we would be um, far, far worse than what we experienced before because it would sort of highlight the realization in market participants' mind um, saying that, well, there is no solution to printing here. Liquidity injection cannot solve what, we, what, we, what is currently happening. And that in itself would um, um, create the, 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 the concept that, well, the Federal Reserve might not be the omnipotent of some sort now. It is mm. more like a, a, an APEC, APEC bank trying to manage risks as any other financial institution. And that in itself would really see significant correction in the market space. Although this is overdue, it's really overdue. The, this bull, the bull market is really overdue. It has been trading at extreme technical um, overbought levels. And yes, this is what is actually needed. But um, we would actually see what, what happens going forward. Interesting. Gentlemen, we need to take this weekend, relax, and hope that when we come back on Monday on Frontier Opening Bell, uh, nerves would have calmed down a little bit and we hope we'll get a bit of some silver lining across the various marketplace. Thank you so much for being on the show this week. IOD Jebo from Afrinvest Securities in Lagos, Nigeria. Ali, thank you so much from Nairobi, Kenya, Rich Frontiers, and Uchina Menes. Uh, from Blue FX Nigeria. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a great weekend. And I'll see you at the other side of the weekend on Monday, bright and early. Thank you very much. I am Bustin Amafaye. See you pretty soon.